Okay, we probably can start. So before Michal will do his presentation on OpenShift V3, we just want to announce the winners of, of this year competition we call Winter of Code. Uh, this year we got a lot of lot of lot of great application and cartridges to the competition, but we have only f three winners in the let's say main challenge and two winners in the enterprise challenge. So we will probably start with the enterprise prizes. Uh, the the application, uh, let's say cartridges, which you win. Uh, first one was, yeah, sorry. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, one of the winners is Mati uh, Kovar. He is also here. You can come here. Uh, so, he created a So he created a Tor cartridge for OpenShift Enterprise, and with this cartridge you can make accessible, uh, you can do like Tor as a service. So it's pretty sweet, and thank you for your submission. And you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe just a um, little warning. If you deploy it, you'll probably get banned. <laughs> um, so, well, I certainly was. Uh, and I had to explain that I'm not doing anything wrong. So you can be whitelisted if you, if you do it. And just, yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Thanks. As Mati is told, like, you can try it on online, but you will get probably banned and your account will be blocked. So <laughs> that's why it's an, it's an uh, enterprise cartridge. And the second one is from our enterprise customer from Spain, from Madrid. Uh, they are not here, I suppose. Uh, and they created a cartridge, a Java cartridge, which is like designed in, uh, in initially for spring. And we will send them a couple of t-shirts and like... Yeah, thanks they, for the yeah, thanks for the contribution. They, the ni ni nice part of it is that they open source it and like everyone can use it now online and even an other enterprise uh, customers. Okay, so let's move to the main challenge. And uh, we have like three great application. The first one is a web-based SSH console uh, with which you can uh, uh, basically SSH, wait a second. Yeah, this is it. Uh, you you will like j just deploy it with the uh, Java EWS uh, cartridge, and you can uh, SSH into your gears on o OpenShift Online uh, without needing a CLI tool. So you can like SS uh, SSH and uh, manage your gears from mobile, and it's great. So thanks a lot. Uh, it's created by Sean Kavanagh. Kavanagh. Yeah, he's from Rally, but he's not an open shifter, uh, on even not a red hatter, so that was pretty cool. He's not yeah, he's not here. So we are sending it we are sending it with you guys to America. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so it's not really. Uh, the second place was for Hibomi uh, Sedlash, and it's uh, a browser game written in Haskell, which in which you can like uh, do multiplayer. Uh, basically, it's just uh, driving cars. It's pretty sweet, and because it's in Haskell, it's pretty geeky. So, yeah, I don't know if Lubomir is here. Yeah, so big applause. Yes, Why Haskell? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> really? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty sweet, like. It's functional. Yeah, it's functional, and it works. And it's so fun. It's right. fun to write it in Haskell, so do that.
And what's your size, uh, t-shirt size? Excellent. And the last prize com goes to a student of faculty of informatics, not this one, but the second one, the Master of University, and is uh, basically a uh, Ruby benchmark for different types of uh, Ruby uh, interpreter. You can just paste there uh, whatever snippet you want, and you will get results. Uh, like the benchmark results. He is also using Docker containers for it, so we think it's like pretty sweet. And uh, I don't know is, if he is here, but is he here? No. Nah. But uh, he is a roommate of our uh, intern, so we will probably ship it to him. Okay. So do you want to explain what these T-shirts are for? And or make, make mark. So make mark. Do you have an idea about it? For people who make yeah, pull requests, explain this. Okay, so this is the main competition that we run, and we just announced the winners. The second is I'm that out of time, so I will be very fast with that because we are getting into his time for his talk. So what we did is we asked people to contribute to OpenShift to make a pull request, fixing documentation, fixing something, doing whatever you want, but contributing to the project. So we had several people who did contribute. We have the pull requests, and we would like to give them the T-shirt. This is the T-shirt that we have here. Can you show it? Make a Superman, please. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so these T-shirts are here for you. We decided to extend the competition. We are not sure how long yet, maybe end of March or something. So if you want a T-shirt like this, please contribute to OpenShift something. Fix documentation, fix something, make something valuable, give something to the community, and we will give you a T-shirt in return. So that's something for you, and if you have any questions to the competition, we will be here too, and you can ask us about it. So thank you, and I'm giving the mic to Mike. Yeah. I already have my mic. That's good. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, so the second part of this uh, OpenShift uh, session is uh, to introduce you the new version of OpenShift uh, 3 we are currently building. Uh, this talk was yeah, supposed to be like a talk of three of us, but actually I'm the only one that, who is brave enough to talk about this. So, so you can find me on the Twitter or GitHub. You can also find Marek and Jakub uh, on GitHub, but Jakub is not that social, so he's not on Twitter and stuff, so you, you can find him here. So let's come back to the OpenShift. Um, so let's talk about the OpenShift V2 first. Like, uh, you already heard about it. You already tried. You maybe already uh, have applications running in OpenShift V2. Uh, so the, in OpenShift V2, you basically uh, take your source code with your application, and you deploy it on OpenShift platform, and we make it running for you. And we also make it scale for you, and we, we maintain it for you, right? So the, the way how OpenShift V2 is currently working is that you have a gear, uh, you put your application inside gear, we run a application server inside that gear. You also can have, if you don't have a scaled application, you can have, uh, you can have a database running in, inside the one gear and so on. So uh, in this new world, like a world of containers, we, um, we thought that it will be good if we redefine the application uh, a bit. So, so most complaints we heard from our users in V2 was that the V2 is uh, very, it, it is custom, customable, but it's not that much deep customable. And you need to spend the time and you need to learn how the OpenShift V2 platform works in order to make it uh, suit your need, basically, right? So, so you need to write a lot of bash scripts and hex, you know, in order to make the application running. So let's redefine the application, what the application means in a new world of OpenShift v3. So we basically want to make the application based on uh, components that are networkly wired together. Uh, so the, the overall architecture will be more service oriented. It will not be like application oriented. So the application consists of set of components that speak each other as a services, you know, and which brings us to the microservices, right? So they are real in new, uh, a new OpenShift. So it, you, there is also, there is an easy way how you can build the microservice architecture for your application. 
We also want to make sure that uh, the applications are very easy to build. Uh, you don't need to write any shell scripts or some uh, install scripts, deploy scripts, or uh, hooks or something like that to make your application up and running in OpenShift. You can easily manage your application, you know, scale it, unscale it, you know, all these kind of tools, and deploying the components. So, so HTTP frontend, uh, which currently is the main entry point for your application in OpenShift v2, is basically one of the components in the OpenShift v3. So the front end is just a service, you know, that serves the HTTP. So you can have a multiple front ends uh, serving HTTP inside your project. You can also have a, uh, other services like databases, you know, uh, Redis, wh 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 whatever. So cartridges will be no more, right? There will be no such thing as a cartridge in OpenShield v3. So basically all the services are equal. So they are containers and they talk each other through the wire, to, through the network. So you might already heard about Docker. Uh, if you not, that you are probably disconnected from internet. So the Docker is the currently the, the hype thing that everyone likes and everyone uses. Uh, we, in OpenShift, in V2, we already had a containerization technology based on uh, C groups, uh, C Linux, and I don't know if you use the Linux namespaces, maybe a bit. Uh, but it was a bit hackish, and it also it, it, there was also missing aspect uh, that is a shareable doc image, right? So you can't just easily export your application from OpenShift and share it with other user that will run it, right? Uh, you, you can you can take a backup, right? Like, but it's not guaranteed it will work, you know, and, and stuff like that. You also can't just easily pull your application out from OpenShift and run it in the same environment on your local machine, right? So we we were we were. Uh, evaluating Docker as, as, as a building block for our new component-based architecture. Uh, the Docker has a great ecosystem right now. Uh, they have uh, more than uh, 45,000 public images available on Docker Hub currently, and the number is still growing. The big companies are looking on Docker. You know, they basically, this is where the industry is leading right now, so everything is basically moving into the containers. And we as an OpenShift, you know, we are going that way as well. So, so basically we are going to replace our containerization technology that we have in V2 with Docker containers. And we are going to base everything on Docker images as well. So why the Docker images are so popular? So first thing, you can share them, right? So you can, you, you can build your Docker image and you can just send it to your colleague or your workmate or I don't know, your sister, whatever. And, and, and that guy can just take your image and run it on his computer without installing anything else, right? He, he just, he just needs to have a Docker and just do Docker run your image. And he will get the same experience, the same environment, the, the same dependencies as you have on your laptop. Which is great because it allows to share the code between environments without any extra setup or any uh, provisioning. Um, we, we also uh, the, the need uh, tools to manage the build process of the Docker images, right? Like, we, we can't say that the users of OpenShift v3 will need to build the Docker images and send it to us in order to make them run on our platform. So it's still like 90% of users on, in the world, or developers, they, they don't use Docker on a daily basis, right? So, so they still have the, the, the source code, they have, they, they have a Git repositories, and we need to be able to take their source code and, and build the Docker images out from their source code and run it on our platform. We also need to, as, we as a platform operators, we need to make sure that all those images that users have got the security updates, you know, got the, their images rebuilt every time there is, there is a new security threat on internet, like a, you know, SSL or bash thingy, so, so every time this happens, like we need to make sure we, we make their, their images secure. We also want to reduce the operational complexity of, of the whole OpenShift platform, so the v, v2, if you go through the install process, is not that it's not, it's not that complex, but you need to put an extra effort to install everything and set up it right. We have a, we have a pretty good suite of uh, puppet scripts you can use for installing OpenShift v3 right now, but it's not a trivial process to do, right? You need to, you need to really follow documentation, you need to prepare your system, you need to have a DNS setup and, and other things. 
Uh, also, for, 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 for the storage, like, uh, we want to use, uh, identify like most components, most services, just need a simple persistent network storage, nothing else. So there is like no magic about storage, you know, host mounted versus network storage. We're just going to plug a network volume to all containers and in that and solve the persistent storage for your uh, containers. So think about the WordPress in the V2 world. So you can't have a scaled WordPress right now, like because if you upload the assets to your WordPress website and you scale it up, you probably the assets will not be transferred to your, you know, new, new gear, or they will be not in sync. So you can you can solve it, but use by using S3 storage, so you can have an S3 plugin in your WordPress, and then in that case, you share the assets between two instances, and that's basically the network storage, right? So, so the V3 will have a network storage by default. We also need to make sure that the operations can perform health checks, and uh, they, they need to know that the, the container which runs your applications is healthy, like there, there, there's, there's nothing broken inside the, the, the container, but we are not going to do it as we did in V2. We are going to follow the cattle versus pet principle. I don't know if you are familiar with that. So, so instead of trying to heal the container and you know make it make, fix it we're just going to kill it and launch another one because we we assume that all the containers are Im immutable so you can just shut down the container and start an, a new one from the image and it should work right uh, there is also some security concerns about the Docker. Uh, we, we, we want to, as I said, we want to provide a great security for, for the Docker containers. This is uh, what Dan Walsh is currently working on, uh, on OpenShift V3 and the, the Docker itself to the, to the project. So we expect like we will have a great security in Docker in long and short term. Okay, so how we went from the Docker to Kubernetes, right? Like because it's not just about the Docker. So what we want, uh, what we want from the Docker. So we want to have access to existing Docker ecosystem. So we want to be able to consume all these uh, 45,000 Docker images, public images that are already available on Docker Hub, right? We, we don't want to invent anything special. So any special magic, uh, any shell scripts, any hacks, no, nothing like that will exist in the v V3. If you push your Docker image to Docker Hub, we will be able to consume it from Docker Hub straight away without any modifications or without any, uh, you know, uh, hacks in, inside, inside it. Uh, we also want to work uh, with the Docker uh, to improve the, the security of the Docker, this is the Dan Walsh work. And we also have a bunch of awesome guys like Vincent and David and other guys that work closely to the Docker community and upstream to make sure that the Docker uh, will become more stable and more uh, reliable platform to run Docker containers, right? What do we expect from the Docker itself is that we will be able to run millions of containers in OpenShift Online in uh, one year. Yeah, one year. So, so the Docker needs to be stable enough to, to handle this uh, load of containers, right? And we also want to be able to manage the containers through the multiple nodes. So. The currently, if you have a Docker, it, it will manage the containers or your single machine, but it cannot manage the containers for multiple nodes, right? So, so it's all, the Docker is tied to the, to the host machine. So we need to solve the problem how we run the containers in a clustered environment, which is where the Kubernetes comes in. So the Kubernetes is devel was originally developed by Google. Uh, they, they are, the, I think they are the best people to know how to handle containers because they already have uh, millions of containers running in, in their cloud. So they are really good about thinking how the container should be deployed, you know, uh, scheduled and, and so on. Uh, so we start contributing to, to Kubernetes. We have an OpenShift team and some other guys from Red Hat. So you can see us on the contributors list. There is also a bunch of other companies uh, looking inside uh, into Kubernetes like IBM, HP, VMware, CoreOS and, and others. So what Kubernetes does, uh, Kubernetes can uh, run the container at a very big scale. So you, ca you can have a cluster that of, of minions that runs Docker and the Docker runs the containers. And you can manage them in the cluster way. Uh, 
It also provides you the operational tools, so, so you, can, you can add the new minions as you want, you can evacuate the, the containers from one minion to another when the, you're going to put the minion to the maintain state. You know, it also provides the resource management, so, so the, the Kubernetes will schedule the container on the minion that uh, has enough resources to, to run the container. You know, and you can also say like how many resources the container expects to, you know, uh, to, to, to run properly and, and so on. So what's the Kubernetes architecture? I, I'm not going to talk deeply about Kubernetes because I know that Mike McGrath did the presentation yesterday, so I'm not going to the deep details, just uh, give you a very top level architecture overview. So in Kubernetes, you have a master and you have a minion. You can have actually multiple masters, you can have a multiple minions. So the master is running the REST API that you interact with. So, so you, you're starting a new pod, you're starting a new replication control, creating a services, uh, all, all other work units, I will talk later. Master also runs the scheduler, so the scheduler decides where the pods will be placed inside the cluster, and it also manages the replications of the pods and, and so on. The minion, has uh, basically kubelet cube, agent running. The kubelet agent relays the information from the master to minions and between them, the cluster. Minion also run Docker. So Docker basically run the containers, right? And there is also proxy service running that uh, provides a simple service routing between, between containers and uh, load balancing and so on. So what glue, glues, what is the transport mechanism that Kubernetes use internally to relay the information between masters and minion? That's uh, ATCD. So the ATCD is a highly available key value store for sharing the configurations uh, and the service discovery between, uh, between systems, between, uh, between uh, virtual machines, for example. So Kubernetes is, uh, sorry, ATCD is very simple. So it has a curlable, it has a HTTP REST interface. You can just use curl to, to, to create, uh, delete, you know, all kind of these operations. It is secure. You can have a SSL security on top of ATCD. It is fast. We did a lot of benchmark for ATCD and our operations actually like it. So you can do uh, thousands of read writes, you know, and it, work, it just works. And his, it is highly reliable. It, uh, it is using, uh, Vincent, do you know what algorithms is using? Rigged, yeah. So, 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 so it's basically when uh, when some nodes get down, it automatically um, it's still able to make decisions and stuff like that. So it's it's very reliable. Even uh, even when your environment or your cluster, you know, gets uh, weird. So. So what are the basic work units for Kubernetes? So the, the low, lowest level resource you can get in Kubernetes is not container, uh, it, it is a pod. So pod represents a group of containers that are coupled uh, together somehow, so they are related together. So you can think a pod is a MySQL server with a PHP MyAdmin, so two, two containers, and uh, the third container is uh, some uh, backupping tool that basically do uh, backups from uh, from MySQL. So that's a pod. It's like a set of three containers. It can be one container, it can be n containers inside a pod. Uh, what is special on pod? Pods are always scheduled on one minion. So they, they are, the, the containers are always scheduled inside one minion. Then you have a service. So, so basically, service is abstraction. It, it's not something uh, physical. It's just abstractions. How you how you say this pod provides this service and it has this IP address and this port. Uh, if you have a service, it automatically provides an environment variable inside your pods, and you can basically do linking, right? Like you can consume uh, the the services uh, across multiple pods. Service also provides a very simple TCP load balancing. So you can have a service, and you have uh, five pods that implement the service, and the service itself is load balancing the traffic between those pods. That's automatically done. We are currently we are currently working on the HA proxy uh, load balancing to to kind of replace or be supplemental to the, the ser service default load balancing. So you, you then have a replication controllers. That's another working unit. So replication controller is basically, I, I call it a pod on steroids. So, so you basically define a pod template and you say, I want to run this 
uh, amount of replicas for these pod templates. And, and Kubernetes may, will always make sure that those a number of replicas is still running. So, so I can say I want to launch my, my PHP frontends. I want to have like five of them. So it will launch the five pods. If, 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 the, if the node that one of those pods go down, Kubernetes automatically launch a new pod on other, other node. So it will always keep the, the amount of replicas uh, uh, to the number. You can dynamically change the, the, the number of replicas by just updating the replication controller resource. And then the last one I will mention is, a la is labels. So labels is not really a resource. It's, it's more about the, the thing that glues uh, various working units together. So, so you specify a labels which are basically a tags in a, in a JSON. And if the labels match through the work units, they are coupled together. Right? So it's, it's very simple. There's no, no more magic there. So this is a... I don't know if you will be able to see it, but this is uh, the, uh, th we have uh, three pods here, pod A, pod B, and pod C. The pod A is a MySQL pod. As I said, it has a MySQL, web, uh, MySQL server, database server running, and it also runs the container with uh, administration UI, which will most likely be a PHP MI admin or something like that. The pod B has just one container, which is a, some PHP uh, application, and the pod C has a, a messaging. You know, active MQ and an agent. Uh, then the the picture uh, right to it. It's uh, how the IP. So so the MySQL server exposed the port three three zero six, and the PHP my admin is running on port eighty eighty. Right. Uh, the the picture below it. Uh, <laughs> define how the storage is managed for, for this pod. So the MySQL container use the network attach storage. Why that? Because we can easily kill the MySQL, launch another one, and attach the same network volume to it, right? The PHP my admin use the local storage because it doesn't need to have anything shared. If, if you kill PHP my admin and launch another one, you don't need to have the same storage attached to it. So, and there is a service. So the service, as I say, is abstraction from the pod. So you have a two JBoss spots running, right? And you define a service called web. And the, you, you basically add two endpoints to that service, so which are pod A and pod B. Uh, Kubernetes will then manage the traffic, uh, like the, the simple load balancing between the, the pod A and pod B. Yeah, that's done automatically. Okay, so let's come back. What a new application looks like, right, in this new world? So this is a nice example. Uh, it actually makes me understand how these things work. So let's say you have an edge router, uh, you see your app.com or whatever. The, that, there, there is a JBoss frontend pods that are serving the frontend of, the, of, of that domain, so the, the web UI. The JBoss frontend pods uh, use the backend service. So the backend service is a bunch of PHP pods that provide some REST API for the JBoss, let's say database access or realize the information or something. The PHP pods then consume the MySQL service, and the MySQL service just run the MySQL pod with attached storage. You can, you, you can just start thinking how this can be easily scaled, right? I can just launch more PHP pods. I can just update the number of replica for me PHP pod. I can just easily scale it horizontally, right? The, the, the same with the front-end pod for JBoss. I can just launch more pods, you know, and improve the, the, you know, the traffic or ma make it better if there is a, there is a high n number of connections coming to or something like that. So it's pretty sweet. Okay, so that was the Kubernetes, very, very brief and quick introduction. So I'll now talk about the OpenShift V3. So as I said, OpenShift V3 will be based on Docker containerization technology, and the Docker containers will be managed by Kubernetes. Uh, so this will basically allow you to do the service-oriented architecture for your applications. Yeah, microservices are real. And it also gives us the flexible way how to deploy the application. You can, you can have a very weird topologies for your networking, how your services are together. You can easily scale horizontally and, and so on. So why we can't just use Kubernetes and we, we say, like, the Kubernetes is new V3, V3, right? Like, why we need to rename it or something? So 
The Kubernetes, I used to say, Kubernetes provides us an infrastructure for running containers, but we are platform as a service. So we need to offer the platform to our users, right? So our users will not going to write the Docker images and deploy it in OpenShift V3. Our user will still have the source code of WordPress that you just want to run in a platform, right? So the OpenShift V3, you can think of as an add-on to the Kubernetes, right? To provide the, the platform as a service experience to the users. So what does it mean, platform? So OpenShift V3 is written in Go, yeah, so no more Ruby. Uh, so it's built on top of Kubernetes, so we actually bundle Kubernetes inside our project, and we just add the things like the, the objects that we need as a platform objects. So what are those additions? So Kubernetes don't know how to build images, right? Kubernetes just know how to run the images and containers. So we need to have a way how we can build the the, the images based on the source code that users provide us, right? We need to be able to make deployments of those so the users can easily roll back, you, the, you know? We also need to have image repositories that will provide more metadata for the images we are going to consume. We also need to handle secrets, right? Like if you, like API keys, SSH keys, uh, allow user to log in into the container in case they want to debug something and stuff like that. And we need to do the source code management as well because we are going to consume the source code. So let's talk about build. Uh, so the build resource in OpenShift V3 allows you build stuff. In, inside the Kubernetes. I'm not going to say it allows you to build only Docker containers. You can build whatever you want in, inside OpenShift build system right now. So we currently have a three strategies you can use. The first one is a, a plain Docker build. So you give us the Docker file, we will just build the Docker image and deploy it for you. Right? That's the most easiest one. Then we have the source to image project that takes your source code, push it, it inside the image, and then deploy the image uh, to our platform. And then we have a custom build that basically say, we will build whatever you want if you give us a builder image. So if, you know, you can have a, your special Docker image that knows how to build stuff, you know, and we just launch the build and we, we will build whatever you want. So, so for example, you can build the RPMs, right? Or you can build uh, the images, you can build the assets, you can build whatever, and then you just handle it yourself. We'll, you know, or you can build your own Docker images and push it yourself, right? Whatever you want. So the result, <laughs> I'm not talking about the custom build here, but the result of the Docker and STI build are the images, Docker images that are pushed to the image repositories so we can actually have a history of your image. So how the, if, you, if you're going to build the image and you're going to push the source code, we are tracking the history, how the image you know, was you know, in the time. So we can actually roll back to the image and stuff. The, the, the limitation that Docker registry currently have is it, will, it won't tell you what's the base image, right? And, and, and other things. So, so this is basically an abstraction for a lack of functionality in the official Docker registry. Uh, the build can actually trigger a deployment of your application. It's very simple. Once the, applica one, once the Docker image is built and is pushed to doc uh, image repository, it will trigger deployment of the application, so your application will get redeployed based on the new image. Easy. So as I said, deployment is there for managing the life cycle of your application. So basically, what happens when a new uh, update is pushed to the Docker image, right? Well, we roll out a new deployment. What happens when the application configuration is updated? Well, then we just record it in time and roll, roll out a new deployment. So the deployment just records the particular image settings at the point of time, so we can do a rollbacks. So if something goes wrong with your image and your application won't start or your application behaves weird or, or you just make a typo in your source code, you can just say, okay, screw it, I just want to roll back to a previous image and we just launch it and you are fine. Uh, in the future, you will also be able to define the conditions on, like you, you can have a, some test or health check that we will perform against your application. If the health check failed, we just automatically roll back to a new to the old uh, image version and deploy it. So I was talking about the source code. Um, so 
Currently, the OpenShift is built in a way that it easily integrates with the external source repositories. So we are not hosting any uh, source code repository like a Git or GitLab or something like that. We just consume the external source repositories. So currently, we have a GitHub hooks that you can set up. And the, once you push a source code to do your GitHub repository, it can automatically trigger a build of new image for, for, for your application. Right? We have also generic webhooks, so you can just uh, consume it inside your Git hooks. And you can also trigger your build from the CLI. Uh, the one thing we were considering during the, uh, during, uh, the work on the architecture for OpenShift V3 was that we don't want to support only Git repositories. There are still people out there that use CVS, you know, or, yeah, they still exist, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and, and they are like a big customers for, for Red Hat, so, so we just can't say them like, hey, guys, just switch to Git, you know, and make your life easier. They have processes and stuff running so on a, on a C, CSV. There are also people that use Bazaar or make Mercurial, even SVN, you know, like Apache, Apache Software Foundation and stuff like that. So, so we decide to, to have the source code management kind of thinky, very abstract, so we can easily plug a whatever source code management system you, you want to use you know, as a plugin. I was talking about the STI before. So the STI is a project that is uh, uh, coming as a component for the OpenShift V3. So STI basically is there to combine the source code of your application with the Docker image. So why you can't just do a Docker build, right? Like, that's a natural question. Like, why you need to use some weird STI tool or something like that? So. It's the, the benefit of STI, for example, is doing the incremental builds, right? So if you, for example, are building your Java project and you are using Maven and you download the half of universe uh, during the build process, you don't want to download the same half of universe when you're doing the next build, right? And next build, and next build. That will just kill your traffic, right? Like, so, so, so we want to be able to take out the artifacts from the previous image and move it to the next, next build and just base the build on the artifacts that already exist. So just do an incremental build. That's one thing that STI allows right now. Uh, in, a, in, a, in the practical life, the STI can build any Docker image. So it doesn't need to be augmented in a way that it indicates this is an STI build. So we are currently working on a proof of concept that you can you can use STI to build, for example, Heroku build packs. So we don't, you don't even need to consume our builders, you just consume the Heroku build packs and it will produce your application image. Uh, speaking about images, uh, so we need tools to manage Docker images, right? That's like natural thing. We, we will, in OpenShift Online, OpenShift Online currently runs a millions of application uh, gears right now. So we need to have a tools that will manage millions of Docker images in the future, right? And need to be fast, it need to be secure and stuff. We also will need to have a good quota story for our users, like how we gonna charge you for what storage, you know, for the Docker size or whatever. So that is like open question. We also need to be able pruning. So once there is an image that is three years old, like we need to know it and we need to remove it if you don't need it anymore. Right, uh, we need to also augment the images, the Docker images with a reasonable metadata. Actually, there are two pull requests open for Docker to implement the metadata functionality. Why is the metadata on images, uh, Docker images useful for us? Think that the, the Im Docker image itself won't tell you, like this is a MySQL service image. It will just tell you like, I'm, I'm exposing port whatever. Right? It's up to you to figure out this MySQL image. Right? So, so we think that the Docker image needs to carry more metadata that will help us to, to basically create a better generation tools for the Kubernetes resources and stuff like that. So, so we can do a, a composition of images and stuff like that. Right? Uh, our operations will need to have a tools for auditing and content tracking. We didn't, don't want to have a Docker images with chill porn or something like that. So we need to have uh, some tools that will do inspection what is inside the image you know, before we launch it in a service and so on. There also will, the, uh, the Docker build is currently the most insecure thing in the Docker world. So we need to have like a better security how, on how we build the images, you know. Currently, the, how it works in OpenShift, how the build work, is that we launch a pod that runs a container, 
and we execute the Docker build inside the container. So basically, we have a container in container, and we mount the, the Docker socket from the host to the container, which is not the most secure thing in the world, right, if you think about that. So we need to have like a better security in the future for this. Okay, I'm almost end. So this is like three questions I always get during the presentations. So the first question, well, when, when I can use the OpenShift 3 When it will be available? So we released the beta one yesterday. So you can download the, the, the zip file and just run it, you know. And the GA is planned for the summer this year. So in the summer, you, you should have the solution you can actually buy. Uh, so what you can, so the next question is, what I can do with OpenShift right now? Like if I download the binary, what I can do? So you can do all things I just mentioned here. So builds, image repositories, deployments, everything is there. You know, we even have a simple web console. It will show you like it's client-based application. It's very fast and very nice. So you can see the deployments. You can see the pods, uh, containers. You can have a graphs and all these fancy things. We also have a very powerful CLI tools that we actually stole from Kubernetes and augmented with our super features. So you can have a build logs and all the other fancy things. Uh, you know, it's basically the OpenShift right now. It's the tool you can you, is a tool that you can play right now. You know, uh, so how you can install OpenShift? You know, so the OpenShift right now. I told I told you OpenShift is written in Go. So OpenShift is currently distributed as a one single binary. So you don't need to install anything actually. You just need to have a Fedora or Arch Linux or Ubuntu that run Docker. If you launch the binary, you get the OpenShift. So, you, so, so what, you, what is actually inside the binary? We have a Kubernetes there, we have ATCD there, we have the OpenShift server there, we have a couple of other services, our augmentation. We have a CLI tool inside the binary. So if you do like OpenShift CLI, you get a CLI client. So you know, no more madness with versions and Ruby and stuff. So it's so all in one single binary. So if you want to learn more about uh, OpenShift and Kubernetes, wait a minute. Uh, we have a great uh, pep available publicly on GitHub. So you can go learn about the architecture, like how the OpenShift will work in the future, and partially how it's working right now. Uh, you can also watch these three uh, GitHub repositories. So the OpenShift slash origin is the main repository for OpenShift v3. The OpenShift slash source to image is the main repository for the STI tool. And there is, of course, Kubernetes repositories that uh, Google owns. And we also have a public mailing list. If you want to talk to us as a, to, to developers uh, in real time, we, we have an IRC channel on Freenode. You can just join and ask us questions anytime. We basically cover all the time zones. So we should be there. You just don't sleep. So thanks. Uh, questions now. Uh, one last information before you ask me where you can get the slides. Like just scan this stuff or come to me later, and I will give you. One. Yep. Yeah, I will make grant. So the question is when the OpenShift V3 is, will be available as online. I will give you a grant, and he will ask for your question. Yeah, that's a uh, very good question, actually. So with OpenShift V3, we are targeting the enterprise customers first. And so that's going to be our first release because... You know, our large, large customers have been, you know, chomping at the bit, very excited to get their hands on Docker. So that's what we've been focusing on now. Uh, once we release that, then we'll look at uh, standing up a public OpenShift Online beta. But we have a lot of work left to do on that, especially with authentication, um, things like that. So to answer your question, I'm not going to answer your question because I don't know, right? But, but it'll be sometime in the future. How's that? <laughs> Yeah, so because we have, I think our last public number was 2.5 million applications on OpenShift Online, it's not going to be easy for us to, to cut those over. So we're going to be running two in parallel. And, and you know, our OpenShift V3 is a container uh, or a container system. We just happen to choose Docker. 
like we could easily switch that out for rocket or whatever the case may be or we could even support our old containers which are called gears and oh, to, to help yeah we actually are working on a story that we will import your application from v2 to v3 if that's possible so yeah next question any question yep I'm pretty sure that some of our architects were evaluating those, but no. Like, we our our Docker orchestration tools is currently, I think, our Docker image orchest orchestration tool is currently OpenShift itself or STI kind of, like touching the Docker images, but nothing else. Like, we are not using anything else. Yeah. It is pluggable, so you can do whatever. Like you can see, uh, right now, I think our proof of concept is just NFS, <laughs> which sucks. But it, it's uh, the Kubernetes offer plugins for that, so you can have network volumes and you can you can do the underlying technology is up to you. Like you can do a plugin. So we expect there will be a plugins, or we will work something that it's better than NFS in the future. Yep. Twenty megabytes. Yeah, it also includes the web console and everything, so assets and all the stuff. So it's all in one thing. We solve the problem of distribution and of the thing. Yeah, so I'm out of time, but maybe one question, like if some. Okay. Yeah, any more questions? Okay, perfect. So you can talk to me on the on the OpenShift stand uh, if you want, if you are shy or something. So, and Diane will run the community uh, version of this talk. And we also have a workshop today that Jakub will be showing the the OpenShift uh, how it is working right now, how you can set up it, and what you can do actually in OpenShift. So there will be a live demo, and we will prove you that it works. So thank you.